Hello, welcome to another Tonalist Landscape Oil Painting Demonstration. This is your painter in residence, M. Francis McCarthy, and the painting I'm bringing you today is called Study After Georgia Ness Landscape. Um, I don't know the title, sorry. Um, I would say it's 1880s period and Ness. Um, not the first stringer, but a nice a nice painting by him, and I'm quite pleased with the study that I made. Um, the challenge on this one was to... Um, to the, the whole bottom area, he does that in this thing where there's a bunch of nothing. I mean, really nothing. It's just um, variations in, in tones and dark. And there's a lot of stuff sort of kind of indicated, but he's kind of doing his two-tree thing, except the... A lot of time when, when he does this two tree thing, that tree that's in the the foreground, for middle ground, <laughs> it's not all the way in the foreground, you know, the front middle. Um, there's only one tree there. A lot of times that would be two trees, but obviously you can see just from my drawing stage, um, kind of his compositional symmetry. And really what made um, Aness great is well, so many things. His color, his composition, his technique, um, his paint application, everything. But his composition, almost more than anything else, I think is what makes a nest totally unique. And one of the things that I'm most trying to um, to get in uh, to my brain. And uh, if you've uh, been around this channel anytime, you know I'm loving a nest. And I've got Oh, quite a few other uh, nest studies planned coming up here. So, I'm going to be reading from a book today uh, called um, Georgia Ness Writings and Reflections on Art and Philosophy. I'll be doing that in a minute. We're going to talk about the painting first. So, this is an 8x12. It's painted on hardboard, aka Masonite in the States. Um, a lot of people, it's untempered hardboard. Tempered hardboard can be problematic, although I've heard the new iterations of tempered hardboard might be alright. The the uh, tempered hardboard is impregnated with oil. That is the difference, uh, which I'm sure would help with resistance to water, um, but may not be so great with doing paintings. So, so I'd stick with the untempered for now. If you have to do the tempered, um, put quite a few coats of gesso on there. Yeah, probably would be a good a good plan. Um, so challenges in this one. Yeah, there's a lot of empty space and um, that bottom bit and uh, the actual painting itself took about three hours. Now, you can see that live version in the members area. You're going, oh, I can't wait to watch you spend three hours doing a painting in, in, in the library. Well, that's maybe, maybe, maybe you, you want to, or maybe you don't. Maybe you seem, do you think that seems like a long time? Um, but I am passing the, the great thing about that is like um, if I was in your town uh, and you came into my studio you probably would love the opportunity to sit there with me as I got a painting done um, especially if I'm passing you a little Bon Mott's along the way giving you insights and uh, well, there we can see our reference a bit um, oh yeah this by the way <clears throat> you would also see my color mixing session in the members area. So it's a little longer, but I break the painting down into maybe the, say, the, the 10 or so constituent colors. Um, I go through my palette and my color approach to colors. So a lot of that's because I've had so many requests for that information. Um, and I still do. I get people asking me on videos that are um, in some cases six years old, what, what colors I used and, and those. <laughs> I have to say, I don't really know. I mean, I kind of know. Uh, and the thing is, people get hung up on that, especially when they're first starting out. Um, if you're just starting out, you should start out with a minimum palette. Okay, don't get all hung up on colors you might not have. Um, a minimum palette, a good minimum palette for you. Not that this will make this video about that, but just just to give you the uh, the insight. Um, a very flexible one would be. Um, Titanium white, cad yellow, cad red, ultramarine blue, and black. Okay, and now a good alternative that would be a lizard crimson instead, um, which is very flexible. The cad red though is, um, and, and it probably if I had to pick between those two minimum palettes, I would go with the cad red these days, uh, especially if I have that black. Because so you'll lose things in transparency, but the CAD red has a lot to offer in, the, in terms of opacity and tinting strength. So 
And when you're working with minimal palettes, you basically are adding tiny amounts of each of the three constituent colors to get the color you're after. Now, doing a painting like this might be a bit difficult. Um, so what, what would I add to that <coughs> as a landscape painter <coughs> right off the bat? Well, you find yourself mixing colors like... Um, like burnt sienna type tones, I, I would add burnt sienna right off the bat. Um, and yellow ochre is another one you find yourself mixing all the time. Um, that gives you a lot of flexibility right there. Um, actually, but before those, I'd probably add raw umber because raw umber is so valuable. Um, well, actually, raw umber is very valuable with the way I normally work, but if I'm working with a minimal palette, everything gets kind of based on those three colors anyway. So. Uh, I wouldn't need as much raw umber, but raw umber would be in there as, as, as I started marching into um, regular palette type territory. Um, what would I add after that? Um, well, you know, actually I would have either ultramarine or thalo. I actually prefer thalo, um, but uh, that would be in our minimal palette anyway. So um, definitely acrylide yellow to make a nice mic screen. You can get a nice green by mixing, you can get an okay green by mixing a cad yellow and black, but it's a bit chalky compared to the the mic screen you would get with acrylide yellow and ivory black. Um, and you know a lot of people's minimum palettes, they don't even have black, you know, um, but I, I, I like black and I, I use it. So uh, anyway, we don't want to, we went already spent a few minutes on that, but just throwing it at you. So. Um, and uh, we talked about the challenges and you can see where we're proceeding here and you'd have a full insight into the co actual colors I used to accomplish this painting. Like I said, if you subscribe to the members area, which is uh, six bones, six bones a month. And I do my best to make that. There's over a hundred live painting sessions there. So you really get the, uh, the meat and potatoes of what I do. Anyway, let's read a little from this book. We're almost at the halfway point of the video and I, it's, it's a whole letter uh, from him. So. Um, he wrote a letter on Impressionism um, to, um, ah, he's replying to an article published in a newspaper. And um, this is his letter, um, Mr. Ness on Art Matters. Now, he was very famous in the States, and he often wrote to the newspapers about art. Um, but this is a letter on Impressionism. And... Um, he criticized Impressionism because it rose, in his words, from the same skep skeptical scientific tendency to ignore the reality of the unseen. Now there's a lot in that sentence, and I'm going to unpack that real quick for you. He was a big believer in painting the unseen reality behind reality, and that's a, um, a goal that I share in common with him. Um, and it's not an overt thing, it's an intuitive thing. So. Um, if you're not an intuitive type artist, it might just seem like a bunch of um, bollocks to you, you know. Anyway, let's go on. Uh, later in his interview is Art and His Religion. Uh, that's on page... Da, 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 da. By the way, we're reading from page 130 in this book. Um, he would dismiss Impressionism as a fad. Given the nature of his work, his criticism was understandable but excessive. Moreover, it overlooked features his painting shared with those of Impressionists, and they do. Loose brush fracture, you know, a real lack of detail. That's a common trait between tonalism and Impressionism. So focus on big shapes. That's a really big thing, too. In fact, you will see uh, sections uh, on George Ness in books on, quote-unquote, American Impressionism. So, um, overlook fee. So... Both NS and the Impressionists presented alternatives to the academic traditions of mimetic, historical, literary, and mythological representations. Both revealed a new dynamic style of brushwork that led many critics to censure their works as unfinished or worse. However, Ines's allusion to the reality of the unseen is telling and resides at the heart of his objections. For the most part, Impressionists held an empirical attitude towards perception and were indifferent, even at times hostile, to religion and metaphysics. Although Ines believed that we perceive reality and form knowledge through the eye, that is through sensory perception, he also knew that we shape these impressions through innate ideas, or as he put it, the ineffable feeling of satisfaction brought in by the logical connection of parts to the whole. For him, this feeling was rooted in an artist's understanding of three-dimensional spaces and forms, an awareness, in his words, of the invisible side of visible things. 
and thus disapproved of the Impressionist desire to divest painting of all mental attributes and to paint on the basis of sensation alone. We're going to have a minute, so I'll get all the way through this letter. He addresses his subject further in his letter to some guy here, which follows below. Um, we won't have time for that. Finally, and that's his reference at the end of his letter on Impressionism, is to the little dark... Oh, I won't even say that. That's not good. Um, yeah. Yeah, we don't want to. We don't want to go there because uh, it's a different world than in us's time. Um, so impressionism, hey, eh? right? Well, the thing is with impressionism, it's very much about capturing the vibrance and intensity of light as it's uh, as it's viewed in the natural world, and it does this using a fairly minimal approach to color. You don't mix a lot of muddy, dar dirty colors. You put bright colors next to each other and they create the color um, effects and harmony and light effects. So you're working with value and your color is based on sort of a prismatic uh, model. Um, you know, like when you shine a white light through a prism, it divides into the three main colors, which is red, green, and blue, right, or yellow. Yeah, red, green, and blue. And of course we have yellow, which is uh, some factor in there. Sorry, I'm not a scientist, and um, I never will be. But um, it's a more scientific approach in general to painting. And of course, the theory of light is only going to be that of so and so applicable because when you're working with pigment, you're not working with light directly, only as it reflects off your surface of your painting. And so all the colors we mix, uh, we mix um, to stand side by side and create the illusion of um, something, you know. Um, but Impressionists often would put, say, if they wanted purple, they put a red note next to a blue note, and when you get back a little bit, you see purple. That, that's definitely an Impressionist idea. Um, they would paint the way a light hits off a vase a certain way in a, in a picnic, um, you know, on a, on a, on a picnic tablecloth uh, midday. You know, that sort of thing would be the kind of thing that it, an impressionist would do their best to to get across with paint and many of much of it is pretty amazing work um, and you know impressionism is you know I almost said this before but the word every artist is an impressionist we're all painting impressions of what we see but they got to co-op that particular title for that style of painting but there's nothing exactly um, about what impressionists do that you know especially earns the the term impressionism you know just lucky enough to get that as a moniker and it's pretty cool because it sticks in people's heads um, you know whereas we have tonalism and yeah that doesn't stick nearly as good but that's all right it's all good and funny thing is uh, he was one of the most popular painters in the US when he was writing that letter um, and there are quite a lot of artists that worked in both tonalist manners and impressionist manners, really depending on whether they were working outdoors. A lot of what impressionism is about is working outdoors direct from nature and trying to get those realistic, fresh colors. Tonalism is not about that. It's about a poetic approach to the landscape. It's about showing an unseen reality. And, and it very much is informed um, by poetic. It's very much informed by the mind and uh, consciousness of the painter you know which of course every painting is but tonalism sort of really embraces that a bit more anyway i can see we're getting close to the end of the video thank you so much for joining me today hopefully you enjoyed this uh study after good old ness it'll be in my store 2.99 us go ahead and buy it i have had um um uh, uh you know a uh, uh, some issues with shipping delays, but um, it will get there to you, so don't worry about that. Um, and I guarantee every painting, every sale, either way, so it's your satisfaction guaranteed, and international shipping is included. So, anyway, if you're interested in this painting, tip on over to the store and buy it and help support this artist. And thank you so much for watching this video and supporting me in that way. And of course, uh, you could check out the members area. People tip in and tip out. It's not like you have to make a lifetime commitment. Um, you can tip in for a month and see what you think and then tip on out if it's not for you.
Anyway, until I come back with another video, do me a favor, do me a solid, take good care of yourself, your family, all your loved ones. And uh, while you're doing that, uh, please endeavor to stay out of trouble. Be patient with the people that uh, have different opinions from your own because you don't know everything. And God bless you and your family.